but something I've kind of learned over the years to stop the phone calls. When is my check going to be there? When is my check going to be there? I tell my clients what the law is. And the law is when the state board approves the agreement and says, you're going to get the check. And I tell them they have to wait 20 days. I also tell them that if the insurance company is not prudent on how they handle it and they pay it outside the 20 days, even one day late, then there's a 20% penalty that's added immediately to the settlement amount. You have a hundred thousand dollar settlement they're paying another twenty thousand dollars hello and welcome to see you in court the podcast that informs you about the georgia civil justice system what it means to you and how it protects individual rights this podcast is a collaboration between the georgia civil justice foundation and the georgia institute of technology your hosts are robin frazier clark and lester tate who are both past presidents of the state bar of georgia and currently serve on the Board of Directors of the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation. And now this episode of See You in Court. Good morning, friends and lovers of the law, and welcome to See You in Court. I am Robin Fraser-Clark, and with me as usual is my dear co-host, Lester Tate. Lester, good morning. morning. How are you this morning, Robin? I'm I'm doing fine. How about you? I'm doing great. You know, trying to uh, try to get life back to normal after uh, after uh, sort of a year not being normal. You know, I have not missed the irony that we started this right about a year ago during COVID when there we weren't going to see anybody in court for about a year. That, that, that's right. This morning, I was uh, I was playing around on Twitter, as I often do to waste time. And some of my British barrister friends were had a thread going about what it's like to be back in court. And, uh, you know, your pants don't fit. Uh, uh, your, uh, uh, you know, it's, it feels funny wearing shoes again. But all, all those things are coming to be. And they're coming to be sort of worldwide, uh, too, which is one of the things that hit me about that thread this morning. I definitely am picking up uh, speed on my cases for sure, and I'm looking forward to being back in court. Um, Well, today we have a a great guest and a great mutual friend, Frank Burns, and I want to introduce our um, listeners to Frank. Frank Burns is the founder of J. Franklin Burns PC and a native of Gainesville, Georgia. He's a graduate of the University of the South in Swanee, Tennessee, where he earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science in 1982. He earned his JD, Juris Doctor, at Mercer University School of Law in 1987. He began his legal career at Gorby and Reeves, an insurance defense law firm, where he represented employers and insurance companies in workers' compensation matters across the state of Georgia. In 2002, he opened his own law practice, J. Franklin Burns PC, devoting his practice exclusively to the representation of injured workers and personal injury victims. He has served on the State Board of Workers Compensation Advisory Council and on the Legislative Committee of the Advisory Council. The Legislative Committee represents all stakeholders in the workers' compensation system and is charged with crafting workers' compensation laws for the state of Georgia. In 2010, Mr. Burns was nominated and selected as a member to the Southern Trial Lawyers Association. He was admitted to the Georgia Bar in 1987 and has been practicing workers' compensation law ever since. Frank, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Robin and Lester. I appreciate y'all inviting me to this. I'm, I'm excited to talk about workers' comp law. It's great. Right. To- Great to have you this morning, Frank. Uh, you know, we were we we were bantering back and forth a little bit before the show, and and you know, I do I do a little bit of workers' comp have for a long time, not uh, probably uh, anywhere near the extent that you do. But uh, one of the things that always uh, fascinates me about workers' comp is uh, trying to explain to clients who come in. Uh, sort of how the system came into being that it was a trade-off between when you get hurt on the job, getting some money and some medical care quickly versus uh, having to wait for a jury trial. And, and for a lot of employers, uh, it, was a, it was a trade-off with a big verdict that came at the end, but often it was after the family was broke or the, the injured worker was dead. Uh, let me just start by asking you, 
how do you think that system has worked uh, here in Georgia? I mean, it started around the 1900s, you know, back in the first Roosevelt administration, I would say, and, and, and a lot of places and sort of spread nationwide. I think every uh, state now has some form of workers' comp system, although they vary from state to state. But what's your appraisal of it as compared to, you know, having the right to trial by jury uh, in these cases where folks are injured on the job? <laughs> Well, Lester, I think it's worked quite quite well. Of course, the state laws are different all across all, all across the country. But I have this conversation often with my clients when they don't completely understand the distinction between a workers' comp case and a personal injury matter, where you go in front of a jury, and it's it works well. And I tell the clients this, and that when you get hurt on the job um, in a, in a workers' comp matter, regardless of who's at fault. Even if the client or the injured worker is at fault, um, there's going to be medical treatment provided immediately um, at no cost to the injured worker. And, and that's a big deal when you're talking about someone that's at work and is try, trying to provide for their family. So it's a no fault system. They get 100 percent of their medical treatment taken care of, and they also get a limited uh, weekly disability check or income. Um, based on how much money they were making at the time of the injury. So it's, it's quick. It, it takes care of the client, um, you know, at least for a period of time. And you don't have to go to trial. I mean, I, I see you in court. It may not apply too much in this, even though, even though we do go to, go to trial, but that you don't have to wait, uh, and you guys know this, two years or longer to get medical treatment. That would not be workable in the workers' comp system. So the trade-off is a good one. Though sometimes it's a, it's hard for my clients to understand it because they they you know they want the pain and suffering. So overall, well, I think it's a great system. Yeah. That's what that was my next question. For those of us who practice up here in Northwest Georgia, uh, all of us have had a workers' comp client over the years where. Uh, you know, they say, well, what about my pain and suffering? And if you can't get that pain and suffering for me, I want to go see uh, my friend and mentor, the late Bobby Lee Cook. I'm sure he can get pain and suffering. And I'd have to explain to him that even Bobby Lee could not get pain and suffering in, in, in a worker's compensation case. So uh, can you tell us what kind of why that is and uh, how that was sort of part of the trade-off here? Well, you know, the, the trade-off was, was simply, you know, employers, and especially in a no-fault system, did not want to have to risk you know, the pain and suffering, the big jury verdict. I mean, they just don't, you know, we don't want to, we can't do that every time someone is hurt in an industrial accident. So we will do the trade-off. We'll trade off uh, uh, no-fault, quick medical treatment, and a limited weekly check. But no pain and suffering, uh, no damages, no going in front of a jury. So it's, again, what I have to tell my clients a lot when they call about it and I explain the system to them is that, look, there's other things we can get for you. There's things like permanent impairment that will, that will pay you for the permanent damage to your body. Uh, you know, it's not a pain and suffering standard, but it is something that you can get from the workers' comp system under our laws in Georgia. So uh, eventually they understand it. Um, but it's, it's sometimes a, a hard, hard pill, I, you know, and Bobby Lee, I, I know you were good friends with him, Lester, and, and, and so with you, Robin, and um, I used to see him down in Sea Island every once in a while back in the day, but uh, yeah, they would, they would like to talk to Bobby Lee if they could, if pain and suffering was part of the system, and it's just not. Frank, you, you mentioned going to trial. Tell us about that. What What is trial in the workers' compensation scheme? Uh, you said you don't have a jury. Who decides? And what issues are you trying in workers' comp? In a workers' comp case, it's simply what we refer to as a bench trial. It is only the judge. But otherwise, it's exactly the same as any other court proceeding. You have live witnesses. You have direct examination. You have cross-examination. You, you, could, you can have an opening statement, you can have a closing statement. All those components of the workers' comp system are the same, except it's only a judge, an administrative law judge that knows workers' comp and specializes in workers' comp that makes, it's the, you know, that makes all the decisions and conducts the trial. So that's the big difference. It's not a jury, but rather it's uh, one administrative law judge that's hearing all of the issues uh, you know, when there's a disputed case, um, they they handle it uh, simply 
by listening to the evidence, considering the evidence, and making a final ruling. So the, basically, those cases would be, and, and kind of correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, uh, the, the work, workers' comp system is supposed to be a self-paying system where if you're if you're hurt on the job, uh, you know, if you uh, if you have a box fall on you at work and hurts your back or whatever, it's it's compensable regardless of fault. So the trials basically involve where uh, the employer would say it didn't really happen at work; it happened someplace else or where uh, they would say, you're not really hurt, you're not disabled, and you could, you, you know, you've been released to return to work. Um, and, and, and sometimes that comes up in the context of later, they've been paying you benefits, but they say, now you're, now you're well, you're ready to go back to work. And like you, Frank, you know, I, I started out defending those cases. And I, I think a lot of people in the workers' compensation world did. And uh, I did it. Uh, for about three years in Atlanta. And then I brought about 15, uh, 15 to 30 cases with me when I came to Cartersville and hung a shingle that I defended. And at that time, which would have been, you and I were admitted to the bar at the same year, I think in 1987. And at that time, uh, I would go, uh, I, I was trying a couple of cases a week. I would go up to Rome with a stack of about five files and I'd settle a couple and I'd try a couple. And I would tell you that I actually uh, learned to try cases and got so much more trial experience so much more quickly doing workers' comp cases that later was very helpful to me, you know, when I was trying other kind of cases. Now, when we have workers' compensation cases, I, I mean, you know, it doesn't seem like anybody's trying a workers' compensation case anymore. I mean, literally, uh, you know, for me, you know, it's been probably a year since I tried a workers' compensation case, whereas before I was trying one almost every week. Um, what, what do you attribute that to? Why do you think that, uh, and, and, and is that just my experience or is that your experience? And, and do you believe the experience of other uh, workers' comp claimant and defense lawyers throughout the state? That's a good question, Lester. And just as an aside, it, it took me 15 years of being an insurance defense lawyer before I finally got smart to start my own practice and do, do what I do now and what you do. And I, I remember as a defense attorney, um, back in the days when we were trying a lot of cases, anytime I had a case in North Georgia, it was this guy named Lester Tate. It was all <laughs> that would be involved oftentimes uh, on the other side. So I do, I do remember that. And, and, uh, and you're right, um, I, I, I certainly seem to try way more cases as a, as a defense lawyer early on, um, you know, 15 or even 20 years ago than we do now. I, I think one of the reasons, well, I mean, let's take this year out. Uh, it kind of changed everything. But even before the pandemic, I feel like in workers' comp that when, when mediations rolled around, um, when the state board began having mediation, settlement mediations and mediations on all sorts of issues, things started to turn because, you know, lots of times the judges would want you to mediate a certain issue before going in front of them. And I, I think folks saw that, gosh, let's let's see if we can work this out. And if we can't, then we will go to trial. And and uh, gosh, you know, since the pandemic with Zoom, I mean, I, I think it is it's just is exponential in terms of how cases uh, are, can be settled very quickly and easily now because you can bring everybody together just like this today to try try to work it out. But but I do in many respects miss the days of going down um, to the board. Lester Heck, you remember it used to be at the CNN building down there yeah. back in the back in the day, and you see your friends and um, you know and you, you know you would you would fight and and un unlike you know. You guys on the torch side, you know, workers' comp case may last from start to finish three or four hours max. It's not something that would go on for days and days and days. So, but but I, I think you know there there are times that we have to try the case even today. Um, but there are few and far between. We we always try to work them out first, and if we can't, then we go to trial. Are are the issues you might try? Are they whether it's a compensable claim? whether it's even a claim under comp uh, or, or is it whether the doctor is the right doctor for the, the claim? 
something like that. It, it, it's a it's a combination. It's a combination of things. The absolute, you know, the cases that are strictly just controverted for some quote unquote legal reason. Um, you know, you see those a lot, even though those can be worked out um, from from time to time. But what what I've seen more often are cases that kind of there's an injury is accepted as compensable. In other words, the insurance company employer picks it up. They're paying for the medical. They're paying for the weekly checks. And then all of a sudden, the insurance companies get tired of paying this and they say, I need to do something about it. So they will maybe create a light duty job that the doctor will sign off on and they'll offer it to my client, which forces them back to a job. Usually it's a not a very good job. It's a job that it's night shift. It's working in a guard shack and they force them back to that. And those are kind of the cases, and it's called 349. Uh, it's it's a 240 case, is what we call it, 349-240. But I find I find myself litigating those cases a lot these days, Les. I don't know if you see that. Those right. are the kind of cases where it's not necessarily you know compensable or not compensable or denied or not denied. It's something that happens as the case moves through the system where you just have to go to court and, and fight and. You know, then you have specialized uh, cases where there may be an intoxication defense that has to be litigated. And for, for a while, we had these things called idiopathic injuries that had to be had to be fought. And thanks to Lester Tate, the Court of Appeals changed that back uh, about a year ago or so. So those are kind of some examples of things where we have to go to, go to court. That 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 was a that that, that was a fun case. Uh, and and. Uh, idiopathic injuries. I know. I know. Even though I'd been to law school, the first time I ever had one of those, had to look up what it meant. And uh, you know, it, essentially, it's something that is caused by by a physical condition of a person, as opposed to uh, something that happened on the job. I guess that's probably as good an explanation as that is. You know, for example, somebody that has an epileptic seizure on the job, uh, that would that would pretty clearly be an idiopathic injury. But if you're uh, if you work at a sawmill and you have an epileptic seizure and you fall into the saw and get your arm cut off, that that would make it a worker's comp uh, type case. But let's let's talk for just a minute about uh, uh, not necessarily about my case, but my, my case went up all the way to the Georgia Court of Appeals. And if you lose, if this one person, the administrative law judge rules against you, uh, whether you're representing the claimant or the defendant in that case, the appeal procedures and the sort of uh, administrative aspect of that makes it a little bit different from some of these tort cases that Robin and I handle. So could you kind of explain explain that a little bit about, uh, uh, because you know er every lawyer knows whether it's a tort case or workers' compensation case, you know, as Yogi Berra said, it ain't over till it's over until that last, that last court rules uh, one way or another. That's a, another good question, Lester. Yeah. In workers' comp, the, the first the first court proceeding is in front of the administrative law judge, where you you know all the witnesses are there and testimony, and you try the case. And you know one other thing's a little bit different than just the, the tort personal injury cases is is that the the arguments are all in writing, written brief, and then the judge issues a decision within sixty days of the final arguments. But once that's said and done, there is a time period for which either party can file an appeal. And in workers' comp, the appeal goes to a three-judge panel called the Appellate Division of the State Board of Workers' Compensation. And the Appellate Division consists of three judges, the chairman of the State Board of Workers' Comp, and then two additional directors. We call them directors. So it's a three-judge panel that actually makes the decision to, uh, to either to either uh, sustain and, and, and find what the administrative law judge did or overrule it or sometimes change it slightly. So that's the first level of appeal. And it's also a little bit different. You, well, it's similar and different in, in terms of uh, tort cases where you file the appeal and then back in the old days, you would, would go to court and you would have a five minute argument. Each side would have five minutes to make an oral argument to the judge, three judges sitting up there, and you have five minutes to, to discuss your claim. You know, of course, the briefs have been sent and all, all that. And that, that was always kind of interesting, Lester, and you know this, that you've got to figure out in five minutes what you want to tell these judges. 
right. uh, to try to get their attention to to either hold on to the decision or or over uh, or return it and and then you got politics involved and I'll try not to get into that if we get the politics of these three judges that we have to deal with. But but not um, always yeah. not always external politics either. I mean you know so if you had a judge that was real well known and real re- well respected below you made you made sure you would say well now this was Judge Frank Burns <laughs> but if it was some you know. Somebody you thought was kind of a, a a goofball, you know. You might say, "Well, that was Judge Tate," you know, that 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 made that ruling where the where they had to look a little closer at it, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, and all that's very similar to what y'all have in y'all systems. Uh, it's you, you, you know the judges, and you don't know the judges and the appellate judges, but but so that so that um, that's the first level of appeal. You get a decision on that, and then if if either party's not satisfied with that. The next level is to the superior court of the county that has jurisdiction of the case. And that can, of course, be anywhere in Georgia. And then when you get to that level of appeal, it's a little bit different. The standard is higher and more difficult to overturn because we rely on something called the any evidence rule. And what that rule means is if the decision, if there's any evidence whatsoever, any evidence to support the finding of the board at the appellate division and the administrative law decision uh, division, then uh, it must be upheld. So that's a difficult standard. Um, but and, and of course, the superior court judges, and I know both of y'all know this, they don't really love workers' comp cases because they just don't know anything about them. And, and that's often, oftentimes why sometimes I'll refer a case to Lester Tate for the Superior Court, because I'm I guessing, you know, well, I'm not guessing, I know he knows the Superior Court judge up there. So I'd rather have there, him in front of this judge than me. So you then have that level. And then finally, you go to the Court of Appeals. And, and, that, and that standard of any evidence remains, but it's even a higher standard from there. It really has to be an issue of law, of, of changing the law. And um, and that's that's pretty much it. I've had cases uh, you know, uh, appealed at the Supreme Court before, but those are, are very, 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 very rare. Uh, in fact, the only case I can remember that went up there, the, the uh, I won't mention the lawyer's name, though I really want to. The, the defense lawyer continued to challenge it, and I, at the Supreme Court, sanctioned the law firm one thousand dollars for appeal, and I, I still have that award somewhere. But, um, but you know, so in other words, it can go all the way up to the Supreme Court, but it's just a different, a different route. So it sounds like you better win in, in the workers' compensation trial. That's the best way to go. That's the best way to go. <laughs> you can. Absolutely. Win it right there and then. Be very you know, hard. Yeah. I, 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 hard I, to reverse. Although that applies to tort cases as well, too. You better win it in the front of the jury. I, I remember the very first argument I ever had in front of the Court of Appeals was in, a, I actually represented a claimant, even though I worked for a defense firm. And uh, he, they had uh, ruled that he could go back to work the day after surgery, which was, uh, I thought, pretty absurd. And I had not tried the case below another lawyer in the firm had, and it got passed over to me to argument argue it. And I remember going in front of the Georgia Court of Appeals, and I said, began my argument by saying scripture teaches that Lazarus rose from the dead and dined with his sisters the very that very evening but most mere mortals can't arise from surgery and return to work the next day which I thought was a pretty good you know was a pretty good intro into the thing but because of what you're talking about Frank the legal standard for the whole thing it, it, it you know it didn't work you know because you were too far you, know, you didn't win at the administrative law judge level and uh, so you, you weren't going to get that turned around, you know, going up on appeal. So I, I don't want to leave folks with the impression that just because you're injured on a job that you have absolutely no recourse into the regular courts, into, uh, you know, to file lawsuits. For example, uh, you know, you're, you're driving to a, uh, a business meeting, you're on the job, you get T-boned by a tractor trailer. And uh, that that uh, 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 tractor trailer driver will say is uh, drunk and speeding and and all that type thing. In those cases, you know, Frank, you do do have, and, and maybe you could talk about that so-called third party 
third party liability cases, where those arise, a lot of times on construction sites and places like that. You're absolutely right. And, and um, in those sorts of cases, I get a lot of my referrals uh, from, from lawyers that do personal injury and tort cases, truck, truck cases, because the, you know, th there is an accident. There's say, say there's a, a tractor trailer accident caused by another tractor trailer company, third party, and, but the person was working. So then there are two different cases, completely separate, really. You have the workers compensation case that pays what they pay. And then there's the third party tort case uh, where a lawyer gets involved and sues the, the other truck driver for negligence and causing the accident. So uh, in, in those sorts of cases, it's it can be very good for the injured person. They've got, they got the tort case that, that uh, could very well go in front of a jury. And you've got the workers' comp case that's taking care of everything right now in terms of medical and, uh, and, and you know, limited income benefits and whatnot. So, the, you know, we do see those uh, a fair amount, uh, especially, and it's usually cases on the roadway. Um, and of course, we I'm not going to get into too much detail about this, but there's also something called subrogation. And Georgia actually has some pretty good law for that, where we not where subrogation doesn't really apply uh, very strongly in this state, where the workers' comp insurance company will try to get money back from the third party tort fees are in that case, which which we fight tooth and nail. But um, when there's an injury and, and there's two different distinct cases, that could be good for somebody that's seriously injured in, in an accident. You know, I have a <clears throat> just settled a, a construction injury case, a death case, and um, they were building a, a large parking concrete parking deck and a spool of wire from the sixth floor of the parking deck rolled over, fell off onto um, my client's husband. And the 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 law says, tort law says you can't sue if the person who did it is the employee of the same employer. That's kind of the catchphrase, employee of the same employer. And I can just remember praying before I found out who had who was the negligent actor, praying, praying he was an employee of a different company. And it turned out he was. Um, you you may remember that case. I think you you had the workers' comp side of it. I, I do recall. Yeah. I, I do recall. I was just praying. Please don't be an employee of the same employer. Please don't be an employee of the same employer. And I got that case from from another lawyer that also hired hired you. Um, it was it was interesting because they were Spanish speaking. It was a ter it was an awfully sad case. And I remember when I heard yes. about the verdict and, and what we were able to do in the paper. That I was so happy for them. But there was a, a major language barrier and I actually had to meet with them in my office one time and then drove out to their house and met with them and ended up getting getting both of us signed up at the same time. But it was one of those cases where I, I was happy as well that it wasn't going just to be the just workers' comp, but also right. yes, but also the court case. So that um, and and that does happen from time to time to time, but you just have to keep you have yeah. to keep your fingers crossed on that. So that was a good result. For sure. That was a good result. There, there's also a doctrine that we have to deal with in the tort world called the exclusive remedy rule. And that essentially means um, sometimes your exclusive remedy is workers' comp. And we got to watch for that. Can you explain that a little bit for us? Yeah, Lester touched on that early on, it, 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 it is, it, and it has to do with the, what the, we call the, the grand bargain or the grand trade-off way back when, when workers' comp laws came into effect across the United States. And, you know, and, and that was, if you're injured on the job, uh, the exclusive or the only remedy you have, the only remedy you have is that in workers' compensation law, uh, which means you cannot sue your employer in negligence. And, and um, you, we see lots and lots and lots of, of motions on these sites of things. Um, I, I remember back when I was a defense lawyer, there was a Marriott sinkhole case, downtown Atlanta, it sucked in, y'all may remember, remember. sucked in all these cars and, and these folks uh, and some people died in that accident. And the Marriott, who my law firm represented at the time, was 
very anxious to start sending weekly disability checks or dependency checks to these families. And they were, I mean, they sent them out within seven days. And the plaintiff's lawyer, who happened to be a former lawyer within our same firm, we're sending those is Nick, back as Nick soon as got, Takis, wasn't it? It's was Nick Mortakis. It was our good friend Nick. Yeah, who, I remember. Yeah, who, who hired me out of law school, and he says he regrets it, but it's you know it's too late now. But <laughs> um, but but no, Nick had that case, and Nick Nick sent those checks back as quick as he could. We're not accepting it. it was not a work related injury or an accident. It, you know, um, there's negligence here. So there was a fight there. I think Nick ended up prevailing, but but uh, those issues do come up a fair amount and it, it really shows how how the exclusive remedy does protect some employers uh and even though the benefits are limited yeah you know frank i i'm, I'm reminded we were talking about starting out defending cases and when i when i came up to cartersville i had i represented oglethorpe power and uh, we had a long drawn out case and one of the issues we hadn't really talked about it's a pretty technical legal issue but it's the statutory employer case where if if a subcontractor doesn't have workers comp insurance the the general contractor can be made to pay but he also gets immunity and i had one of those cases and uh, uh, i i litigated it all the way to the georgia supreme court where i lost uh lost uh getting only two dissenting votes that it was not exclusive remedy and that the power company had to go to trial i ultimately won it in trial after a two weeks in federal court. But uh, that case pretty much destroyed, it's called Pogue versus Oglethorpe Power. You may be familiar with it. And it pretty much destroyed a lot of the statutory immunity that, uh, that uh, insurers got on construction sites and stuff like that. So about, about 10 years later, you know, I have a case and I, uh, the, it's against the, uh, against the gas company. And I go uh, to argue that case, and the judge, you know, the, the other side's moved for summary judgment on uh, uh, exclusive remedy. And uh, the judge said, well, I, I, I've heard your arguments and I'm kind of inclined to, gr to grant the motion, but it's which, which would kick me out of court, said, but I will uh, listen to anything else you got to say. And I said, judge, I want you to read Pogue versus Oglethorpe Power because unless the ruling of that case is Lester always loses, I think I ought to win this time. <laughs> And uh, he said, well, send me a copy, you know, and I sent him a copy and he actually ruled in my favor and we ended up getting a $2 million judgment in the thing in the end. Uh, but uh, it, that's one of the fun things about practicing law when you bet on both sides, you know, there's some, uh, there, there, sometimes uh, what was your mortal wound before turns into be the spear this time. Well, Lester, that you raise a good point on the statutory employment, and and, so, and sometimes it can be very helpful on, on my side where you get some small employer, um, a roofing company, for example, that you know is it, it's violated the law. They have more than three employees, but they don't have workers' compensation insurance. So when you when you can go up the ladder, as I call it, in statutory employment, and find the general contractor that hired this roofing company who does have insurance, when I can go up the ladder and attach the case against the general contractor, that's always good for my clients. Usually these roofing folks who are injured are injured very badly for obvious reasons. And then of course the general contractor can go after the uninsured roofing company employer to try to recoup some money. But of course that's usually a lost cause, but, um, but there is a lot of litigation. That's a complicated area of law, truth. I mean, you, you know, just like you, like you found in the Pope decision. It's let very me, let, complicated, let, let, and and I I assume the general contractor doesn't doesn't really jump at the chance to offer your your client insurance. <laughs> I'm guessing that's an issue you, you have to fight about pretty hard. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Let's I I, I want to go this you you probably you're you're a big city lawyer so you probably don't get uh, these walk ins like I do sometimes. But uh, I get folks, and because we have a lot of people, I, I hope, that are listening that aren't lawyers and maybe are just employers, you know, out there. I mean, I, I've had cases where, you know, about once a year at least, I have somebody come to my office and they say, look, I got this business and, um, and, and you know, I got five people that are working for me, but they're independent contractors. <laughs> you know, they're not employees. And, uh, uh, you know, I send them, a, even I send them a 1099, you know, here's what, 
here's what uh, here's what I send them at the end of the year. Uh, but uh, as we know, uh, for workers' compensation purposes, that person still needs workers' comp insurance in a lot of instances. And there are a lot of factors like time, manner, and means that, that you and I know uh, that play into that. So could you kind of explain that to people out there who maybe have the impression that they can say, well, my, my, my folks that work for me are all independent contractors, so I don't, I don't, I'm not subject to the act. Well, that, that is something that it comes up, and the, and the act is very, very straightforward. That if you're an employer in the state of Georgia and you have three or more employees, you're required to have workers' compensation insurance. And of course, the definition then is what is an employee and what's not an employee. And that's what some of these companies try to do is to designate independent contractors who, in fact, are, are really employees, but they know. If they make them independent contractors, they don't have to have workers' compensation insurance. And if they get hurt, they are, they're completely on their own. And, and this, this comes up a, a lot, too. Um, when, you, when you truly do have a case where there's an independent contractor, usually truck drivers, they'll have these occupational injury insurance policies, which the independent contractor driver will buy, which does provide some of the, some of the elements of workers' comp. But, but I'm not able to take the case because they're not an employee. But the, the, the arguments, uh, you're seeing way more of these now with Uber drivers, with Lyft drivers, with Instacart and all these kinds of folks. And, you know, they are understandably independent contractors. But in some ways, you really want to go after them. You want to go after the Ubers and the Lyfts. Um, when, when, when you know, somebody has a bad accident and there's some sort of, some sort of negligence. But um, there's been cases that I've handled before where, just like you say, Lester, <clears throat> they claim to be an independent contractor, and I go back and take the case. I'll go take the deposition um, of somebody at the employer and talk about, you know, did you control his time, his method, his manner of doing this work? Did he work anywhere else but with you? Um, did, you know, could, he, could he leave when he wanted to? Uh, did you have the right to hire and fire this particular so-called independent contractor? And if you go through the checklist of those certain things, then you can prove that they are not independent contractors, but rather employees, and there should have been insurance. So, so that, that is another area, Robin, when you talked about earlier, you know, what sorts of things go to trial, something like that can easily go to trial because there's so many issues and you have depositions to take and lots of uh, evidentiary uh, of issues that have to be decided by a judge. It just reminded me that I really don't know much about this because I told you I don't do any workers comp, but I do remember something about ability for y'all to, to resolve a case where everyone agrees your client wasn't an employee um or a no liability stipulation is involved can you talk a little bit about that Gosh, i just know that lingo that's all i know <laughs> I, i'd like to get lester's i got to get lester's opinion on this too that the, the no lie the famous no liability stipulation famous. and the famous um I, i'm not going to use a swear word but but somebody in my old firm <laughs> used to call it the um the no darn liability stipulation and agreement is what he called it, but but he <laughs> used a different word. But um, it, it was really just you know it's an easier tool to use. It's easier for the defense lawyers to put it, it put together. But even though it appears on its face to be work related, um, you know if nothing's ever been paid, no medical, no weekly checks, no income, and there's just issues about those sorts of things you're trying to get, they can do a no liability stipulation. And the document is written where it says there was no injury by accident. The claimant wasn't hurt. Everybody agrees. You know, the contention of the employee is this, contention of the employer is this. We now agree that you were not injured. Well, as you can imagine, what Lester and I have to go through when we try to explain that to our client when they go. What do you mean I wasn't hurt? I was yeah. hurt. I'm sure they don't like that. I'm not lying. I'm not going to sign this document. It says I'm lying. And, and I have to go through all of this with the client. And it's very difficult pretty much to say, look, it's just, 
it's just boilerplate language that we use and it can possibly help you in the future. You don't have to admit that you got hurt on the job. You know, that can be a protection, but, but lots of times they're very upset about the language of the no liability stipulation. And in fact, I, I, there was a case, gosh, long years and years ago, where somehow I ended up in a court of appeals on the witness stand having to explain to the judge the no liability stipulation and agreement. I mean, I can't remember the facts of why we got there, but somebody got <laughs> irate with it. And my law office you know, put together the agreement and the judge summoned me to court to explain it, you know. So um, that was that was sort of that was sort of interesting, but I, I don't like that. The, would be a like little too liability. interesting for me. Yeah. So so let's <laughs> let's go back for just a minute and 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 uh, give, give a little definition here. So workers' comp cases, the the manner that what's a settlement, what's called a, really a release, you know, in other contexts is usually called a stipulation uh, in the workers' comp context. And, uh, and that one of the things, you know, the, the opposite of a no liability stipulation is not a, li a liability stipulation. We call it a bona fide dispute stipulation. But for folks that aren't interested in maybe quite that much minutia, one of the things that might be important is to talk a little bit about how workers' comp settlements differ from tort settlements that like Robin and I may enter into where you know, we, well, they pay us money, we sign a release, nobody else is involved, uh, where the fee is simply for, for the lawyer is simply set by contract. It doesn't require any approval. So can you talk a little bit about how workers comp uh, is, is, is different in that respect from, from tort cases? It, another, another good question that you, that you raised, Lester. It is, it is quite different. And, and just the, the few tort cases I've had over the years have been kind of nice where you settle the case, you sign the release and you get your check pretty quickly. Uh, not so in workers' comp. What the workers' comp law requires is that there be the, the document that we were just talking about. They're called stipulations and agreements. Uh, there's two types of stipulations and agreements. There's the liability or bona fide dispute stipulation that is pretty standard. Um, that goes through everything that's going on with the case, the amount of money, the attorney's fees, uh, and the general leases, and then the no liability stipulation that we just talked about, that is, is about two pages, and it, it, it says there's no liability. So you have these documents, but the difference is those documents have to be signed by, by both the parties, by the lawyers, by the clients, and then they have to be submitted to the State Board of Workers' Compensation for full review. And um, of course, now we're now in the electronic age, thank goodness, and the system in workers' comp is called ICMS. So the documents are sent to the State Board of Workers' Comp. There's a division called the Settlement Section of the State Board. And it, we've, had, we've had the same guy for a long time, but, but ultimately uh, the directors are the ones that sign off on the agreements. But the, the agreements are reviewed. They're actually looked at and reviewed to make sure that uh, everything is done appropriately. Um, you know, arguably, they're, they're looking at is whether fair or not. Uh, I think they look uh, way more closely if there's an unrepresented injured worker or claimant. They look at those for sure to make sure that the insurance company is not trying to pull one over. Generally, when there's both lawyers on both sides, they just make sure the language is, just co is correct. They make sure that the numbers are correct. And once they go, to, go through that process, they approve it. Now, um, do they just send a check right away? No, they don't. The insurance companies have a 20-day window, a 20-day period to, to pay the check, to send the check to the claimant's lawyer settling the case. And um, that's always an interesting dynamic with my clients as well, because as soon as we settle the case, they want to know when they're going to get their check. But something I've kind of learned over the years to stop the phone calls. When is my check going to be there? When is my check going to be there? I tell my clients what the law is. And the law is when the state board approves the agreement and says it's approved, you're going to get the check. And I tell them they have to wait 20 days. I also tell them that if the insurance company is not prudent on how they handle it and they pay it outside the 20 days, 
even one day late, if they paid on the 21st day or 22nd day or 23rd day, then there's a 20% penalty that's added immediately to the settlement amount. You have a $100,000 settlement, they're paying another $20,000. And when I tell a client that, I always tell them this, I'm going, all right, you know, Mr. Smith, it's gonna get approved. Your, your weekly check is gonna stop, but it's gonna be 20 days. I'm not gonna call the insurance company and remind them. I'm gonna be quiet as a church mouse because I want them to miss the deadline because we're both making more money. So, so that's, that's um, and, and, and from time to time, Lester, I bet you've had it before. Oh, yeah. They do, they do mess up. And I have a big old smile on my face when I, when I get to let them know they owe that 20% penalty. And so does the client too. I've had, I've had a mess up and then they, they wanted to try the case and explain it. And it's, it's just a, you know, it's a, it's a straight, uh, it's a straight, you owe, you owe 20% more. <laughs> while we're while we're talking about amounts a little bit, um, and 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 I'm asking you this very generic case because you know Frank, we both know there's some folks that uh, you know like if you're a if you're a paraplegic, you may not ever want to settle your workers' comp case because you're getting you're you're getting 100 percent of your medical care paid, which could be phenomenal, and particularly if you've got a third party uh, recovery, you know, someplace else. Uh, and then there are other cases that are just sort of you know, oh, my hurt back, you know, what we call an oh, my hurt back kind of case where, you know, somebody has a strain or a sprain or something like that. Um, so uh, talk to me about how you go about evaluating a workers' comp, a workers' compensation case. Uh, and and I'm, I'm really talking about the process as opposed to any case, because uh, that's, that's one of the questions that I get all the time. Like, well, I'm not going to get any pain and suffering. How, how do I know, how do I know how much this case is worth if I'm going to try to settle it? Yeah. Well, that, that's a, you know, it's an interesting question because that, I mean, that's something that it comes up every day. I mean, I, I'm the one that screens all our cases in, in my, in my firm. And it, it's a, a, a little different. I've had lawyers ask me before, Frank, do you have a threshold? of what kind of workers' comp case that you want. And I generally tell them, no, I really don't. If they got hurt at work and they have an injury, uh, then I will talk to them because you just don't know what's going to happen with that particular injury. These days, with the advent of social media and the internet, we literally get calls within an hour of the accident sometimes. Lester, you've probably seen that sometimes too. Yeah. And we're able to through e-sign and DocuSign to sign these clients up the same very day sometimes, which means, gosh, we don't know the extent of, of the injury. They haven't gone to the, they, they've gone to the doctor once. So, so if it's a kind of injury, I mean, some of the injuries are easy. If there's a fractured body part or something like that, that's a no brainer. But even in the cases that don't seem to be too, too you know, terrible injuries, I'll take them just to see how they do. And um, to me, it, to me, I'm doing my job as representing somebody, you know, representing people. That's what I do because I feel like it's the right thing to do. And then if I find out it's a strain or a sprain and they're going to be OK, then I can get out of the case very, very, very easily. On the larger side of the equation, and you talked about the paralysis types of cases, those and I've, I've had those. I've got a couple now and and. It's a situation where with the high cost of medical and what they're going to have to pay over lifetime, I mean, in a, in a, in a quadriplegic case, I've got a client now that gets 24-7 care and it's terribly expensive and they have to provide that for lifetime and the housing and everything else that you can imagine. In those cases, some of those settle and some of them don't. And then the advent of Medicare set-asides, I don't know if you want to get into that uh, to the listeners today, but those cases can be problematic. But uh, I, you know, I take I take those as well. Most times we have cases kind of in between those, and um, I look at most all cases. I, I really do. I you know, if you have the, the the exception would be this: if it's a burn injury and it's not a sort of injury that seems like it was going to be any sort of infection, I generally won't take that. That, that's just something I, you know, I know they're going to get better uh, over time. So it's, um, you know, I have to look at them carefully, but, but I, uh, in workers' comp, it, it's, it's not, I don't have the liability versus liability questions that y'all have in tort. We don't have, don't have to worry about that. And then 
you know, how much medical treatment they get. It's not a big factor on the cost. So I, I hope that answered your question. It, it does, but also like when you're t when you're looking at submitting a settlement demand, because that's one of the things that I, I, you know, I have, you know, with my clients, you know, I say, I want to demand X amount of money. And they say, why X amount of money? And, uh, you know, my response is typically, well, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, I, I remember when I was defending that uh, one of the defense lawyers worked with used to say, well, almost any workers comp case is worth uh, 26 weeks worth of benefits, you know. And as a as a claimant's lawyer, I think they're worth about a year at least, you know, worth worth of benefits. So you know, sort of differing evaluations there. But also, and and maybe you could explain this. You know, I have to tell them about their PPD rating and what's that, which is really not even a disability rating; it's a, an impairment uh, rating. So how do all those come in? To, how, how does Frank Burns go about putting that all in the in the black box and coming out the other side with a with a settlement demand? Oh gosh. Well, and there's and the question I thought I get so many, so many times when we're getting near the point of trying to settle the case and I, they've asked me for years, they've tried to ask me in different ways. So Mr. Burns, you've been doing this for 30 years, you know, and you, you, you know, what's going on, you know, you know, this, what's the, what's, what do you think I'm going to get? And I hate that question. And I, I have to be sometimes kind of flip it. Like, look, if I had, a, if I had the crystal ball, I could tell you, but I don't. I have no idea what they're going to pay on your case. And we're not going to know until we get the money because every single case is different. You know, it, it's just, it sometimes can depend on the claims adjuster or the insurance company. The state of Georgia doesn't settle workers' comp cases. Um, certain insurance companies are, 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 you know, pay a little bit more money. Some are extremely cheap as we call them. So all that comes into play, but, my valuations don't change based on that. I, I do. I, I look at the case, and sometimes I'm criticized for this, but I look at the case from a settlement standpoint of the absolute worst case scenario for the insurance company. What are they going to have to pay? And, you know, and, and, and all the different benefits that they're entitled to under law, temporary total disability benefits, which is the weekly check they're getting based on their total disability. Another benefit called temporary partial disability, which is a check they can get if they get injured, they're on light duty, and they've gone back to work. That's a potential benefit the insurance company has to pay. And finally, the permanent partial disability or permanent impairment, which is a little different, is based on what the doctor says the permanent damage to the body part is, the leg, the arm, the body. And whatever percentage that doctor assigns to that body part, there's a formula in the code that says you're going to get X amount of dollars for that. So all those, I call those the money benefits in the workers' comp system. You add all of those up and you're basically doing an estimate or projection over the life of the claim. And then you throw in the medical, don't throw in, but then you include the medical treatment uh, you know, for the period of time, and you put together a number. My numbers are generally large, and I, I like doing that because you just don't know. I've been surprised before. If I make a super large demand, I, I feel like sometimes I get a get a, a higher settlement eventually. But it also requires me to have to explain to my client, Frank, you made a two hundred fifty thousand dollar demand on this case, and we only got seventy five thousand. And I'm like, look, guys. I'm shooting for the moon, the stars, and the sun. I'm shooting big. And you, you never know what they're going to do, but you know, they're going to start out at $2,500. So just get ready. But um, I basically, to answer your question, I, I kind of evaluate the case pretty much the same in terms of the number. If there's a lot of problems, I may, I may show them the big number, but I'll, I'll discount that by 30 or 40%. If I know I've got, a, if I know I have a problem with the case, so that's kind of a work of art, and I try to train my folks to, to do it. And, and one one aside, I had a lawyer that used to work for me, former defense lawyer, and he, he felt like he was smarter than me, and may have been, but not in terms of settling. And he always felt like if he went to the defense lawyer with a fair and reasonable settlement demand, you know me, I'm a defense, former defense lawyer. And I swear he said this in a letter one time. 
I'm not Frank Burns. I'm not going to give you the Frank Burns demand. I'm going to give you my demand. And darn if he wouldn't settle that case for half of what I would, because he just didn't make the right demand. And um, it's very frustrating. So that's kind of how I handle it. Every lawyer's different, but that's how I handle it. I, I think one of the things with that, Frank, is that you, you talked about mediation, you know, that the, uh, the <laughs> that, that, that was true. That was probably true back in the day where uh, you had, uh, when we were trying a lot of cases and the insurance companies gave their lawyers a lot of leeway about what it was worth and now, but uh, you know, one of the reasons I ultimately got out of the, uh, the, the defense side of the thing was the claims adjuster wanted to tell you, wanted to report to you what the case was worth instead of the other way around. So if you were just dealing with the lawyer, it was one thing, but you've got claims adjusters and I, I'm not at all being critical of them because they've got constraints too, you know, within their companies, you know, and whatnot. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you one more question, then I'm going to let Robin get a word in edgewise here. I don't mean to monopolize this, but uh, but you're representing me in a worker's comp case, and I, I, I call you up and I say, Mr. Burns, you know, I've been going to this doctor, you know, ever since I fell off the ladder at work, can't get any relief from my back, uh, but my brother knows this doctor over at Alpharetta that's just really helped him. And he fell off a ladder, you know, at his job too. Why can't I go over to this doctor in, in Alpharetta that helps my brother so much? Why have I got to keep going to this, this uh, quack that, uh, that the insurance company picked out for me? Well, it's, that's another part kind of a really going back to the exclusive remedy doctrine that we talked about earlier, the, kind of the grand bargain. So, you know, not only did employers under the workers' comp systems, probably across the country, but definitely in Georgia, not only did they escape liability for, for tort damages or negligence, they also got the advantage of <clears throat> when someone is hurt at work and it's accepted as compensable, the employers are allowed to put forth six doctors, a list of six physicians in their area that they get to choose, the employers do, or the insurance company, and the injured worker is required to go to one of those physicians on that list of doctors. It's called a panel of physicians. And, um, and the, the medical will not be paid if you go outside of that panel of physicians. And to, to the point you made, Lester, is that, you know, I'm going to Dr. Smith, the quack, who thinks I can go back to work, um, who thinks I'm not hurt. Uh, I want to go to my friend, my, my friend's doctor in Alpharetta, and he's going to he's going to take care of me. Well, he can do that, but the work, but workers' comp's not going to pay for it. He's going to have to pay for that on his own because it's outside of the list of physicians chosen by the employers, chosen by the insurance companies, and it, it really is a, a, a problematic. It, it 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 comes into play almost in every case. Who is on the panel? Who is on the panel? Who are these doctors? And we know them all. We know the groups of doctors that are always, we know they're kind of what they're going to do in certain cases. And, um, and we're, we, and we have to hold our nose and pick one of those physicians uh, to treat our clients. And then you also, under the law, you get to go from one doctor on the panel to another. You get one free change of physicians um, on that panel. So, they, you know, there's more limitation there. Um, you also get under workers comp, you get one free independent medical evaluation. That's a, 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 a that's, that's very good for us claimants lawyers where the insurance company has to pay for a doctor we choose. I could, I could tell my client, go see that Alpharetta doctor. Um, I want him to be a specialist. I want him to, to know this area of your body that's injured and the insurance company has to pay. It. So that is a benefit, but for the most part, the panel of part of the law, it can be problematic for us on this side because we're, we're dealing with doctors that, that may not be too sympathetic to our clients. Frank, I want to talk for a minute about your work on the Workers' Compensation Advisory Council. Um, you've been on it. How many years have you been on this council? For, for a um, while, right? Yeah, over about 20 years. I, I, was asked, I was actually asked to join after I became a claimants lawyer back in 2002. So it's been a while, almost 20 years. It, it sounds like it is essential to the workers' compensation scheme, 
especially the legislative committee where you're you're part of the group to to change laws. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about the council and, and your role on it? Yeah. Um, the I could go on in two different directions on this, Robin, but I'm not going to do it. But but the the advisory. <laughs> The advisory council at the State Board of Workers Compensation overall is a very, very good system. And lots of other states across the country emulate us and, and look to us because it's a, a group of um, what we call them stakeholders. And the chairman of the State Board of Workers Comp picks this group of folks. It's probably 100 people total, maybe maybe a little bit less than that. But it's it's folks across the state you know, there are defense lawyers, there are claimants lawyers, there's insurance people, there are employer representatives, there are rehab suppliers, there's every single stakeholder that's in the workers' comp system are, are part of the overall advisory council. And then there's certain committees that are charged with doing things for the system. Uh, two, two of the important committees um, and all of them are important. They're all they're involved with different things, but the, the committees that you hear about the most are the legislative committee and the rules committee. And I, I started out 20 years ago on the rules committee, which I really enjoyed, and then did, uh, ended up um, being transferred over to the legislative committee, which helps make the laws. We put together a package uh, amongst all of us that, uh, that, that is vetted very in great detail. And we submit that package, which is changing the law in Georgia, which changes the law in Georgia. We submit that package to the chairman. The chairman uh, takes it to the Capitol and it's vetted. And uh, it's it, it, nine out of 10 times it becomes the law. So it, um, it, it is important. Um, it it, it kind of keeps everything centralized within our group, as opposed from people coming in from different areas to, to attack the system and change the law. Uh, and overall, it, it's worked quite well. Uh, I won't get into the politics of it, but Robin, you know a good a bit about it. Um, someone that you're married to, but we won't we won't get into that. Uh, if you did, who was who was who was who was, who was, who was unbelievable? It was an unbelievable component. Part that, that's why I stayed involved in the advisory for so long is because of your husband. But um, but at any rate, it, it's a good system. Um, I'm, I'm glad that I'm on it, and and we have to fight really really hard for injured workers every day on that committee. I I have definitely lived through many of your annual meetings, and the angst and and you know the, the stress of those meetings and what all goes into it. But when you say you deliver a package that's going to become the law, that's an agreed upon package by both claimants lawyers and defense lawyers, right? So it's not just one side gets its way, it's agreed upon. Absolutely. And and within the group, uh, we all, we call it consensus. There has to be consensus among all the stakeholders. We all have to come together and it's, it's vetted. Let me tell you what, it's vetted every which way you can imagine that the chairman of the particular committee will, will set up subcommittees and we hammer things out and year in, year out, there's certain issues that pop up. Subrogation used to come up all the time. One particular issue that has been kind of a thorn in our side over the years has been the issue of the temporary total disability weekly amount, um, the maximum amount under law. And that is an, an amount that's set by statute. Uh, it's currently uh, at the maximum rate of $675 a week. And that rate is determined based on a formula. You take the average weekly wage of the injured worker or the claimant, and you take two thirds of that. And whatever it is, it is, but it maxes out at $675 a week. Well, for years and years and years, uh, that amount was very was very low. Lester will remember back 30 years ago, at one point, the maximum rate 
was one hundred and seventy five dollars. It was I was going to say it was one hundred and seventy five dollars a week that's, when you and right. I started Praxit. So we're, we're, we're like five hundred dollars old, <laughs> you know, in the in the workers cop TTD, you know, arena there. It's gone from one hundred seventy five to six seventy five yeah. during our our tenure at the bar. Right. And, and um, but, but what's been frustrating about it in terms of the advisory is that it's something that has to be worked out every year. And there's vetting, and then you get into the politics of we call it horse trading. Well, we'll give you a raise in the average weekly you know, the, the workers' compensation rate, the maximum rate, but you're going to give us this, and and that became frustrating. What, we're, what we've been pushing for for many many years is something called indexing, indexing, where it's based on just a formula based on where the wage is in the state at the time. What is the average wage? And that just depends on what's going in the world, in the economy. And that way it's just said, it's not based on politics. It's not based on who's on the committee. It's not based on the political wins, but it's based on a formula. And so far, we've not been successful in that arena uh, to, make, to make that happen. But maybe one day we can, you know, depending on what's going on in politics. But, but a but, lot of states do have that. A lot of states do have that. I don't know what the breakdown is, but it's, uh, it's not a... a it's not a pipe dream. No, it's not a pipe dream. And Georgia is quite low. Uh, we're very, you know, for years we were the lowest in the country or maybe the 49th. And we, we, we get, you know, we're getting up there, but we're still lower than most, which is, which is frustrating. But, but uh, we're, we're working on it. it. We're working on it every time we meet in the advisory council, we're talking about it. So maybe one of these days we can make that happen. Have you ever thought about or tried to estimate the number of workers' comp clubs you've had in your career? Gosh, um, when I started out, it, it was just me all by my lonesome. I, I shared space with another law firm. They eventually <laughs> were nice enough to <clears throat> give me a half a paralegal. And they, as I tell them now, they put me in a broom closet. They didn't give me very much space in the law firm. But I started out by myself and then my practice grew over time and uh, with more paralegals and more lawyers. And so it's expanded over the years. Um, I, I have kept track uh, of the number of cases that I've signed up over the years. And it's, it's uh, almost 4,000 cases over, over a 20 year period. Um, now, of course I haven't handled all those, that's impossible. I've had other lawyers handle those and I use generally keep a lower caseload than some of my attorneys just because I have to do all this other stuff. But, but we, we've, we've helped out a lot of people over the years and I've been fortunate enough to get cases from all across the state. And um, we, you know, we have clients that send us return business and we, we've had the occasional client that's gotten hurt more than once and they come back to us again. So, um, yeah, we, we've um, and, and that's, you know, that's way different than in the tort world what y'all do y'all y'all get a case it's a major case that you have to try you may have that case for years and tremendous amount of litigation involved so we don't have that really in the workers comp field as much looking back over your career um can you say if there was a one particular case that you'll always remember or a highlight of your career that you want to share or you know, if you're talking about, I remember this case, anything like that, that, you know, that you, you'll always remember and, and feel good about? But really, two. Uh, one, we just touched on, Robin, that you worked on that um, the, the poor gentleman that fell from the parking deck and died, that, that uh, we jumped on that case extremely quickly and were able to get that case settled for in workers' comp land for a, a nice amount of money for this poor family quickly. And I want to say we settled very that case quickly. From very, very quickly. And, and I'll always remember that. I just um, spent so much time and, and, and actually had a defense lawyer that was, that, that actually, um, be careful here, a defense lawyer who had some feelings and she, she did a good job for her client, <laughs> but, but she, she worked hard and, and, uh, that, that case, I'll always remember. I had one other case that, um, that I think I still think about it and involved a young man that was paralyzed from the waist down. And I, I, got, I got it. Um, and he, he was just, he was, a, he was almost a kid, but 
but he was just sharp and smart and, and he had a really good job and um, just a tragic injury where he was paralyzed from the waist down. Had complete use of his upper body, uh, was able to, to work with the wheelchair very well, but he was one of the folks that never accepted the fact that workers' comp just didn't pay the kind of money that, that you would in a tort case. And he, he worked me over pretty good. We, we you know, it, it took a while. But we were eventually, and, and as time went on, I got to know him. I got to know his mom. I got to know his family. He had a, ch he had a child. Um, and I got to know him really well. And we, and we worked on that. And he made me do a few things I wouldn't normally do in a case. And he ended up being right. And I just just liked him. And I, I told him, he, always, he gave me a hard time, too. This kid, it was always kind of, it was like a friend. He gave me a hard time, which I, which I kind of liked, too. But I told him one day, I said, yeah, we're going to do something when we, you know, when we settle this case. He said, yeah, right, Frank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You probably said that to all your clients. I said, no, we're going to really, we're really going to do something. I'm going to do something nice for you. And we're going to, we're going to go do something fun. So we <clears throat> eventually settled that case. And we settled that case for a significant amount of money. Um, and I was so, so happy about that. But um, what, what I did for him was after that, within, I don't know, maybe a couple of months, um, he, he used to like to gamble, um, before he was paralyzed and I took him to Las Vegas. Uh, we, we jumped on a plane, a jet first class. We went to the Bellagio and we gambled for two days. And I just remember that just being so much fun. And, you know, he, he was able to get around and, you know, we worked out one day together and he played, you know, he played, uh, what did he play? He played roulette and I was playing craps. And that was just a very satisfying thing to be able, and I have photographs somewhere, uh, of being able to, to do a good job for him and to, to take him to Vegas with me and, and uh, enjoy that time. So that that probably is my number one case of all these years that I've, I've handled. So um, I need to reach out to him too. I haven't talked to him in probably a year. So I'm, I'm glad you asked me that question. I'm going to reach out to him. That's great. That's a great story. Yeah. Frank, what what advice would you give to a young lawyer just starting out? You know, you, your career started on the other side of the law, and then you opened your own firm, and you've been successful for over over 30 years now. Um, looking back, I guess I'd say write a letter to the younger Frank Burns. What would you say? I think what I would tell them is, you know, you, this is kind of cliche, but follow your passion. But it, it, it took me, Lester figured out, I think, in three years, being a defense lawyer, he needed to do this all day. It took me 15 years, 15 years before I decided to go out on my own. And you know, part of it was, I, you know, I was with the firm. I, I enjoyed the people I worked with for the most part, most part. But I was still an employee, you know, and, 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 but I was representing insurance companies. And it, it, towards the end, it just was not a passion and when I finally pulled the plug and decided I was going to go on the other side and represent injured workers only, that was a big deal from being from going for 15 years. And I was a partner in the firm and all that. But it was by far the best decision I have ever made in my career to switch sides and take that leap of faith because I was scared. I, I, you know, I didn't take any cases with me. I didn't know my friend's firm put me in a broom closet. I didn't know what was going to happen. I was newly married. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was a leap of faith. So what I would tell a younger Frank Burns was don't wait 15 years, do it faster than that. <laughs> do your passion. Say, you know, learn the law, go the Lester Tate way, learn the law and then, and, and do what you want to do, whether it's changing areas of the law or starting your own firm, just go with your passion and, and you will be very glad that you did. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about that young Lester Tate. There were probably some times in that first 15 years that I thought, "What the hell have I done?" You know, but uh, <laughs> but uh, but I, I absolutely agree with you that you know about finding your passion. You hear, a, you know, there are a lot of young folks right now who are disgruntled with the practice of law, and uh, so many of those, I think, it involves what setting they're practicing law in. And uh, not uh, not not the practice of law generally. You know, some people are some people are cut out to you know like to do workers' comp claimants practice. You know, others like me. You know, I've had a I've had a more general practice, although workers' comp's been a big part of it. But I still 
you know, I still do criminal cases. I've tried a couple of murder cases and some federal wow. drug cases, you know, stuff like that. Uh, but there are others that are cut out to be corporate counsel, you know, and that's that's what they they need to do. And there's some folks that that really are uh, cut out uh, to be defense counsel. And Frank and I have uh, have have thrown a lot of spitballs maybe today at our brethren, the defense counsel. But we were defense counsel at one time, so we're not. Uh, there's two sides of every case, and and. Uh, you know, uh, when I was a defense lawyer, I always felt blessed the man who sues my client. You know, that's how that's how I make a living. Yeah. So uh, I, I and I think the workers comp bar, particularly the other thing with Frank and I, the workers comp bar is very small and uh, and a pretty tight knit group. And uh, so we, we hadn't said anything here today. We wouldn't say to their face either, or that they wouldn't say to us, you know, if, if, uh, if it was, uh, if it was reversed, it's just a fun group, I think overall to hang out with and probably one of the most collegial uh, bars in terms of plaintiff and defense uh, intermingling that I, that I've been a part of when I compare it to, you know, to like the car wreck bar or something like that. I agree, Lester, hundred percent on that. Well, Frank, we always save this last question for every one of our guests. One day we're going to put, put a string of these together, uh, and I ask you to be thinking about it. Um, but can you tell us what your definition of justice is or your notion of justice? You know, I was thinking about the question and thinking about, well, you know, what is justice? What's the definition of justice? And I, you know, I was going to go look it up. I never did but because, you know, I, I look at, I look at justice as kind of a, as a concept. I, I look at justice as, you know, the, 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 the top of a mountain, the, the top of a steeple, the top of the tallest building in the world. It's just the pinnacle. It's the ideal where we all want to go at some point in time. We want to get there. We want to get where there is justice. And, and whether it's in the courtroom or whether it's our class and life in general, we just want to get to that point to be at that pinnacle. And it, it, you know, it's, you know, I guess it's the pledge of allegiance, you know, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all, justice for all. And that's what we, we just need to, to try to attain that as best <laughs> we can every day in our lives. And, um, you know, as, as lawyers, we're, we're in the you know, judicial system, but I, but I think it's just an ideal way up on the top of the mountain we need to look at and we need to try to get there as best we can in every one of our cases and every day, really every day that we work and every day of our lives. So that's how I feel about justice. Great, Frank. Thank you for being with us today. We've really enjoyed our conversation about workers' compensation law, and um, we appreciate everything you've, you've told us and just spending the time with you. Um, again, for our listeners, we've been talking with Frank Burns uh, about workers' compensation law, with, which he is a um, specialist in. You may find out more about Frank at his website, jfblaw.com, jfblaw.com. Thanks again, Frank. It's just been a wonderful, wonderful day with you. Great Thanks, seeing Frank. both of y'all. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. I really, really appreciate it. It's been a you fun, too, Frank. It's been a fun time. Thank y'all. Well, Robin, each uh, each uh, podcast episode, we try to bring an issue from the news uh, that our listeners might be interested in. Uh, we've had the the common, the uncommon, the unexpected, uh, all, all sorts of uh, of things. Some of them technical, others not. Uh, mine today is from uh, uh, an article last month uh, that was in the uh, the Mississippi uh, Clarion Ledger entitled Mississippi Supreme Court Orders Third Trial and Car Crash Case. And it involves a case that goes back to 2008, uh, which was against the uh, auto manufacturer Hyundai. Hyundai and uh, uh, products liability case, bad wreck that, that uh, 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 killed some folks. There was a 2008 trial in which the jury awarded 1.5 million to each of the three families for a total of 4.5. Hyundai appealed in the Mississippi Supreme Court in 2011 ordered a new trial. Mississippi Supreme Court, by the way, is, uh, as memorialized by John Grisham, famous for throwing out jury verdicts, uh, as we know. Uh, but it did in this case, and in 2014, there was another jury trial 
in which the jury awarded $3.5 million uh, to each of the three families for a total of $10.5 million. Now, uh, last month, this case uh, was uh, reversed again by the Mississippi Supreme Court, probably not, uh, not, probably not surprising uh, as a statistical matter, but uh, the, the reasons behind this are fascinating and, and do read like a John Grisham novel because the, uh, the Chief Justice Michael Randolph wrote that a new trial is warranted because an attorney for the families had paid a self-described consultant who boasted about holding revivals and fish fries to try to gain favor with potential jurors. And he said that the uh, attorney, Dennis Sweet, had later tried to conceal his connection to the man when uh, Hyundai sought to overturn the judgment uh, from the second trial. He says the total record uh, before the court evinces that a fair and impartial trial was not had. We find overwhelming evidence of actual impropriety, which destroys any confidence in the jury verdict. The facts developed in this record threaten the public's confidence in our jury system. However, uh, one of the dissents by Justice Jim Kitchens uh, was strongly worded and said that uh, the depictions of the man who was supposedly paid as a consultant relied on nonsensical stereotypes about black people, both Sweet and Sparks are black, and that the wrongful death trials took place in Coahoma County, which is majority black. Uh, it is far-fetched to imagine that any attorney would expect to influence potential jurors by hiring a preacher to hold revivals in advance of a trial, hoping that some of those summoned for jury duty would have attended the revival, that some of the attendees would end up on the jury, and that they would recognize that the preacher sitting behind the plaintiffs and then decide to violate their oaths and award money to the plaintiffs, Kitchens wrote. Uh, it's a remarkable case. A lot of folks who want to attack our judicial system, uh, like the United States uh, Chamber of Commerce, you know, have already picked up all this and tried to make it to be uh, some sort of uh, uh, McDonald's coffee cup uh, type of uh, verdict. But I think it's just a fascinating uh, story. Uh, I don't know more about it except what I've read in the newspaper. But uh, I do, uh, I, I will say I've practiced law for 34 years and I never, never in my wildest imagination thought of hiring a preacher to preach a revival in a fish fry <laughs> to try to help me win my case. So uh, I, I, I think it's interesting. It's, it's, it's particularly interesting coming from the environment that it does. And uh, I look forward to reading more about it in the next John Grisham novel uh, that uh, that comes out. And so that case is headed to a third trial now. Headed is to that a third that? trial. Her, to a third trial. And by the way, uh, you know, it went from 1.5 million a family to I think 3.5 million a family. So uh, you know, getting it reversed and getting a new trial doesn't always work out uh, the way that. Uh, uh, right. the, the way that uh, the defendant thinks it might in a case like that. But uh, yeah, I also, if, if it follows that trajectory, the next part going to be like $10 million per family. That's right. That's right. <laughs> be careful what you ask for. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, uh, Robin, and tell us about yours. Let me mention, you talk about John sure. Grisham in Mississippi. I need to remember that Mississippi Clarion Ledger is probably a good source for some of our uh, host banter. It is. It absolutely, absolutely is. Uh, well, my my story that I'll share with you um, is about art and the life. Uh, many of you know I I love art. Um, my walls are covered in original art, and I have an artist for a son, and I love to promote his art. But this has to do with um, a painting that is the world's largest canvas and it recently was sold for 62 million dollars in wow. dubai yeah and it's it's by a british painter named sasha joffrey and it's over 17,000 square feet and the name of the painting is the journey of humanity um and he sold it to raise money for uh children affected by covid19 uh, he had hoped to get $30 million, but a businessman in Dubai named Andre Abdoun bought the entire panel, um, which is huge, uh, for 60, 
60, what did I say, 62 million. And then at the same time that that comes out about the, the artist, this artwork coming out and being bought for 62 million, the United States Department of Transportation recently released their annual guidance, departmental guidance on evaluation of a statistical life in economic analysis. And they actually put a dollar value in the life of an American. And this year it is valued at $11.6 million. It's gone up obviously every year um, steadily, but now they put a value of the life of $11.6 million. So why do I say this has anything to do with the law? I have many, many cases involving the death of a loved one of the client, a lot of wrongful death cases. And I tell the jury about how much I think the value of life is. I often look to artwork uh, and say that if this panel, this 17,000 square foot panel was worth $62 million, surely the value of someone's life is worth more than a mere painting. Um, and surely it's more it's worth more than 11.6 million that the U.S. Department of Transportation tells us a life is worth. Um, so I like to keep up on these sort of things in the art world, but also from our own government. Our own government is telling us they think the value of the life is 11.6 million, um, which to me, when I'm arguing in front of a jury, uh, that should be the floor then, what the U.S. government says. So I just bring that to light and I keep keep looking at it and uh, always am aware of what others in the world think the value of, of something is. Yes. The, 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 the jury charge I think in Georgia is that a life is worth whatever the enlightened conscience of a fair and impartial juror, jury jury uh, believes it to be. And so those kind of examples are, That's right. are uh, absolutely uh, uh, very, very uh, important. Uh, and I also it. just want to say that we, we, I want to say that we know that the um, jury in the Derek Chauvin trial involving the murder of George Floyd is out in Minneapolis. And my thoughts and my heart are, are with that jury. And I'm praying that justice be done. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, Robin, do you want to close us out this week or do you want, do you want me to do that? Um, I, I, I'll, I'll let you close this out. Okay. Let me, let me, we don't often do this before you, you close us out. Sure. Um, let me, let me mention some credits that we don't do every, every episode, but I want to thank our sponsor and remind everyone, our sponsor is the Georgia civil justice system. You may, uh, foundation, the Georgia civil justice foundation. You may learn more about the foundation at fairplay.org. We also thank our producer, Taras. Raz Misher, and we thank our listeners. And, and uh, I want everyone to know you can learn more about host Lester Tate's website, Aiken Tate. It's A I N T A T E. Actually, Aiken Tate. Aiken Tate.com. Yes. And my firm, you can find out more about me at my uh, firm's website, G A Trial Lawyers.net. You may learn more about our podcast at cuincourt.squarespace.com. We hope you subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends and family. You can find See You in Court on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere you get your podcast. And if you want to send us any questions or make a suggestion about an interesting legal topic, see you in court podcast at gmail.com. That's all I got, Lester. That sounds great. And uh, until next time, we'll see you in court. Thank you for listening to See You in Court, brought to you by the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation and the Georgia Institute of Technology. Please subscribe to this podcast and consider writing a review. You may find related documents to this week's episode on our website, cuincourt.podbean.com. Please send any questions, suggestions, or ideas to see you in court podcast at gmail.com. The producer of this podcast is Raz Misher. We thank Noreen Hassan, Associate Professor and Director of Outreach and Community Engagement of the Georgia Institute of Technology School of Literature, Media, and Communication, 
and the Georgia Tech students who help bring you this podcast. I'm Fred Smith, Executive Director of the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation. You may learn more about the foundation at fairplay.org. On behalf of Robin Fraser clark and Lester Tate, until our next episode, we'll see you in court.